Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News Art, India's Voice to the World. I'm Preeti Kaur. Coming up in the next one hour. Israel bans the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees from operating on its territory. US and other allies express concern. U.S. says North Korea has entered Ukraine conflict by sending 10,000 troops to Russia. U.S. decides not to impose new limits on Ukraine's use of arms. Anxiety grips the U.S. as campaigning for the general elections turns into the final week. Trump and Harris focus on pivotal battleground states that may decide the race for the White House. Big boost for India's healthcare sector. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to launch multiple projects on the occasion of 9th Highway the day. A tragic incident has occurred in the morning in southern state of Kerala. Around 160 people were injured in a firework accident during the Kaleyattam Thayam festival in Virarkavu Anjutabambalam temple in Kerala. Now around 100 people are admitted to different hospitals and 8 are said to be seriously injured. The incident occurred at midnight as the firecracker collection meant for the festival caught fire from nearby sparks. Most of the injuries happened as the crowd tried to escape from the site. The true extent of the accident is yet to be unraveled. Officials reached the site for further rescue efforts. Ajay Joy is joining us to get us more. Ajay, spell out more details. We tell our viewers that the fireworks caught fire by nearby sparks. You get us more details and the latest updates. Yeah, uh, pretty the latest update is that the uh, district administration, the police, uh, is saying that there has been a very serious lapse in the uh, safety protocols that were followed uh, in this uh, festival. Um, permission was not sought for having the firecracker displayed as it demands. Um, so that is the first major lapse and what we understand right now is two people have been taken into custody. Um, uh, for this tragedy, uh, the president and the secretary of the general festival committee both have been taken into custody. That's what district police uh, right now uh, is saying. Uh, so, um, what emerged out is that the, the whole firework collection uh, that was stored uh, in a place very nearby uh, to this whole uh, festival venue, and even crackers were burst also. Uh, that, that was happening. The, the site for bursting also was very nearby. So, this is something uh, shouldn't have happened. Um, uh, the devotees were, were resting in the nearby area, so uh, these are all added uh, to this uh, very sad incident right now. Uh, I, should, I should put it very sad because this festival, this temple festival basically heralds the whole season of Kaliyatran festivals throughout North Kerala, so it's very sad occasion right now. Um, around 100, around 100 people are still admitted to hospital. Uh, as far as we know right now, eight people are seriously injured and, uh, and it remains critical. Uh, that's, that's what the information we get from the administration so far. The incident happened in a place called uh, uh, Nileshuram uh, in Kasaragod, uh, the northernmost district of Kerala. And this Anju Temple and Virakau Temple is a very famous one uh, for its Kalyatam Tiyam ritual art. Ajay? So, uh, Yes, yes. All right, you're, you're getting us the update on those injured. Uh, uh, tell us more about this festival because the visuals which we are showing to our viewers uh, on air, they show a, a lot of people have gathered, uh, you know, and the space seems compact. Uh, help us understand, uh, did that uh, somewhere have a role in this tragedy? And get us more on the Kaleyattam Thayam festival. Uh, tell us more on how is this celebrated and, uh, you know, get us uh, more on this. Yeah, Kaliyatam is a very prominent uh, ritual uh, in uh, northern Kerala, the Malabar side, uh, where uh, the deities are supposed to uh, uh, supposed to uh, 
get into the Kalyat, uh, Kalyat and the Tiyam artist and uh, it will be like an oracle uh, for the whole region uh, on behalf of the deity. And so this is a very grand occasion for people in North Kerala. So that's why there was a huge crowd in this, uh, in this temple venue as well because uh, this festival, basically in this temple, it heralds the whole season of Kalyatam in Kerala. A uh, lot of uh, different varieties of Tayyam will descend one after another uh, in, during Kalyatam. And uh, it's a grand occasion for family gatherings also where people from abroad will also join the families during this season. So uh, that's what really made uh, this incident a very serious one because there's a, there's a whole huge crowd of devotees out there. And uh, the way in which crackers were stored and burst added to this tragedy. From what we understand it, uh, it, it they didn't have the permission, they didn't seek the permission uh, for this uh, firecracker uh, uh, display and uh, storage. So that's essentially a very serious lapse. And now uh, the district administration is still uh, starting the investigation procedures. Uh, as far as injuries are, injured are concerned, uh, things remain the same so far, age remains uh, critical uh, in different hospitals. That's what we understand, Prithi. All right, Raja, we leave it here. Thank you for joining in with those details. That was our correspondent, Ajay Joy, telling us some more on the tragedy which struck uh, Kerala. A tragic incident happened in the southern part of the state where around 160 people were injured in a firecracker incident that happened during the celebration of the Kali Yattam Theyam festival at um, a temple in Kerala. We'll keep you updated. Uh, he talked of the people injured. Uh, meanwhile, let's turn to other news uh, which we are tracking this hour. We'll uh, talk about the crisis in West Asia. Israel passed a law on Monday banning the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency, UNRWA, from operating in the country. The lawmakers cited the involvement of some UNRWA staffers in the October 7th last year terrorist attack on southern Israel and for staffers having membership in Hamas and other armed groups. The ban, which enters into force in 90 days, would effectively prevent UNRWA from operating in Israel and also target its operations in East Jerusalem, where it currently provides some essential services such as cleaning, education and health care in certain neighborhoods. It is also feared that UNRWA employees in the West Bank could potentially face problems moving from one place to another as well as assessing East Jerusalem or Israel because they would lose their ability to coordinate with the Israeli authorities to cross the checkpoints. The same fears apply to visas and permits delivered by Israeli authorities. Israel has called repeatedly for UNRWA to be disbanded with its responsibilities transferred to other UN agencies. The UN said in August that nine UNRWA staff members were involved in the October 7th assault and had been fired. Israeli lawmaker Sharon Haskell said that if UN is not willing to clean this organization from terrorism, then they have to take measures. So this legislation is disconnecting the relationship between Israel and between this organization. Um, they will not be able to facilitate their uh, activities or their infrastructures or their uh, headquarters in Israel. If the United Nations is not willing to clean this organization from terrorism, from Hamas activists, then we have to take measures to make sure that they cannot harm our people ever again. Israel has faced heavy international pressure to do more to elevate the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Though the ban does not refer to operations in the Palestinian territories or elsewhere, before the legislation was passed, foreign ministers from France, Germany, Britain, Japan and South Korea and Canada and Australia issued a statement expressing grave concern. The United States has warned Iran and the United Nations Security Council on Monday of severe consequences if it undertakes any further aggressive acts against Israel or U.S. personnel in the Middle East. The Security Council met after Israel struck missile factories and other sites in Iran before dawn on Saturday. It was in retaliation for Iran's October 1 attack on Israel with about 200 ballistic missiles. Iran's UN ambassador, Amir Saeed Iravani, accused Washington of being complicit through military support for its ally. 
Israel's UN ambassador Danny Dannon described Israel's strikes on Iran as measured and proportionate and said that it would continue to defend itself. While U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, told the 15-member council that Washington encouraged the government of Israel to shape the operation as it did. The United States did not participate in this military operation. Whether, rather, we encouraged the government of Israel to shape the operation as it did. Again, a targeted proportional and direct response to degrade Iran's ability to threaten its neighbors, deter further attacks, and reduce the risk of further escalation. Today, the United States' message for Israel remains clear. We will always help secure its people and territory from Iran and its terrorist proxies and partners. Our message for Iran remains clear as well. Should it choose to undertake further aggressive acts against Israel or U.S. personnel in the region, there will be severe consequences. We will not hesitate to act in self-defense. Israeli Iron Dome defense system intercepted over 100 Hezbollah projectiles that were fired from Lebanon on Monday, while trails of smoke could be seen in the sky above the Israeli-Lebanese border as rockets flew overhead. An Israeli army spokesperson announced that approximately 115 projectiles fired by Hezbollah crossed from Lebanon into Israel. Also, Israel continued to strike southern Lebanon. After nearly a year of exchanging fire across the border, Israel intensified its strike on southern Lebanon and beyond over the last month. All right, for more on this, we are joined in by Amit Mukherjee. Amit, good morning. Now, uh, the Israeli parliament has uh, banned the, uh, the representatives of UNRWA from the country. Help us understand uh, the consequences of this move and also to what extent will it hamper uh, the accessibility of humanitarian aid in the region? Well, Preeti, basically this move by Israel uh, revokes the 1967 agreement which allowed uh, this particular agency, UNRWA, to operate in the areas which were under the control of uh, Israel. Uh, that includes, of course, Jerusalem, uh, East Jerusalem and West Bank. But now, because of this, uh, uh, the uh, Israeli government is now restricting the work of this UNRWA in, in its own territory. Uh, primarily, there is two reasons. One is, of course, uh, uh, Israel has been citing that uh, uh, People who were involved, who are associated with this organization, are also affiliates of Hamas. In fact, investigations actually reveal that there were about nine people, nine persons who were uh, part of the uh, Hamas organization and were also working for this UNRWA. Now, the other thing is that this agency has been. Uh, this is what the allegation of Israel has been that this agency has been kind of promoting hate. Uh, against um, you know Israel, you know that this is what they have been teaching Palestinians, and uh, also another thing is that uh, you know uh, this agency was formed about a year after Israel state was actually formed in 1948. So at that time, UN had uh, formed this uh, particular body to assist all those uh, Palestinians who were displaced during the formation of the Israel state in 1948. This this uh, organization started its operation in 1950s. Now, another thing which Israel is quite opposed to is that this particular organization re uh, recognizes, uh, you know, the descendants of the 1948 uh, 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 Palestinians who were who were actually refugees, the descendants of these refugees as refugees. So, um, uh, Israel is against the, uh, you know, uh, the whole concept of recognizing the, the descendants of the 1948 refugees as refugees again. So, this was another reason, and in fact, even before. This attack on Israel had happened on October 7th uh, last year. Uh, Israel has always been pushing for dismantling this organization, saying that you know the, some of the activities of this organization were against the state of Israel. In fact, this, uh, the two bills were passed with overwhelming majority. In fact, one was passed with 92 versus uh, 10, and the other was passed with about 87 uh, uh, in favor of this bill against nine uh, against nine who were opposed to this. Uh, Priti. All right, Amit, also at the same time, the U.S. has uh, come down heavily on Iran uh, at the UN United Nations Security Council, uh, warning of severe consequences if it undertakes any further aggressive acts against Israel. 
uh, also help us understand uh, how grave and severe is this warning though repeatedly the international world uh, has called for restraint help us understand when it comes from the UNSC how important and significant is this well us has always been saying this in fact even before the strike has started you know uh, israel had uh, uh, the us had actually asked iran to exercise restraint because this action if it had if would, it would have happened you know uh, by israel uh, attacking iran it would have been a retaliatory action against what had happened on october 1st where 200 missiles were actually launched into israel so repeatedly you know uh, even when there were talks and and uh, and information was leaked about a, 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 a prospective uh, strike by Israel uh, on Iran. Uh, U.S. had said that uh, uh, you know uh, there should be restraint uh, exercised by Iran, and also it kind of also war warned uh, Israel not to attack the oil installation and other nuclear installations of Iran, uh, which could lead to escalation. So it should have uh, should limit uh, its responses only to re reactionary measure against the October 1st, uh, uh, you know, action um, by Iran. So uh, U.S. has been, you know, warning both Israel as well as Iran to be uh, to exercise restraint in their in the in their offensive uh, against each other. Uh, All right, Amit, we'll leave it here. Thank you so much for joining in with those details. That was our correspondent, Amit Mukherjee, uh, speaking more about the Israeli parliament. Uh, banning the uh, UN relief agency RNW, R, UNRWA officials from entering and operating in the region. And also amid the continuing conflict in West Asia, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and his Israeli counterpart Yoav Gallant discussed opportunities for regional de-escalation during a telephone call on Monday. Mediators include Qatar, the United States and Egypt, whose President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi on Sunday unveiled a proposal for a two-day truce in the Israel-Hamas conflict that would include a hostage release. Israel said on Monday that the head of the Mossad spy agency had returned from talks in Doha with his CIA counterpart and the Qatari premier where they discussed a new framework for a Gaza hostage release deal. Though Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday said that he had not received a proposal yet. British Prime Minister Kair Starmer welcomed Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Mikati to the Downing Street on Monday evening. After shaking hands during a photo call, the two leaders sat down before talks and expressed their joint aim to bring ceasefire in the West Asian region, de-escalation of hostilities and the implementing of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701 in action. According to the UN website, Resolution 1701 is taking steps to ensure peace among them, authorizing an increase of force strength of the UN interim force in Lebanon to a maximum of 15,000 troops that would, among other things, monitor the cessation of hostilities, supporting the Lebanese armed forces as Israel withdrew from southern Lebanon and ensure the safe return of displaced persons. On to Russia-Ukraine conflict now. A uh, Russian guided bomb devastated Kharkiv's iconic Dersprom building on Monday, a 1920s landmark and UNESCO recognized site, injuring six people. Now, this followed an early, earlier bombing that wounded 13 and a rocket strike in nearby Chuhuv, injuring eight. In central Kriviri, a Russian missile hit a residential building killing one person and injuring at least 11, sparking condemnation from President Zelensky, who urged global action to end the violence. Meanwhile, a drone attack killed a medic in Kherson, where three people also died on Sunday. U.S. President Joe Biden condemned North Korea's troop deployment to Russia on Monday, labeling it a very dangerous move. Now, this statement followed the Pentagon's assurance that it would not impose new restrictions on Ukraine's use of U.S. weapons if North Korea joins the conflict. NATO confirmed that North Korean troops are stationed in Russia's Kursk region, with Secretary General Mark Rutte warning this alliance threatens both Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific security. The Pentagon estimates 10,000 North Korean soldiers are in eastern Russia, some potentially preparing for combat. Russian President Putin cautioned that any U.S. support for the Ukrainian strikes deep into Russia would be a red line. Meanwhile, Ukraine's President Zelensky called the deployment an escalation as North Korea's foreign minister Cho Son Hui relieved for Russia amid troop 
this patch. You're watching DD India News. We're heading for a short break, but after the break, amid calls by president to take to the streets, people in Georgia protest against the disputed election. Croatia to buy 50 leopard tanks from Germany in swap for Ukraine. Presidential frontrunners to face off in the second round in Uruguay. Runoff vote scheduled for November 24th. Geopolitics and trade deals. Economic challenges amid development. Hard work and the path to prosperity. It's the economy always. Between walkers, money is what money does and says. Supply creates its own demand. Between the bulls, pulls and bears, tears. When supply chains globalization and India rises to the podium. We'll get you centered with the economic brief at 8 p.m. every Thursday on TD India. Welcome back after the break. You're watching DD India News Hour. As both Republican and Democratic presidential nominees Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are in tight rope walk just a week before the November 5th polls, they are trying to reach out to new sections and consolidate the old ones. Republican nominee Donald Trump on Monday reached out to faith based leaders in New York. Members at the National Faith Advisory Summit include Pastor Paula White Kane, placed their hands on the former US President Donald Trump and they prayed for him one after another. Later, Trump flew to Atlanta to address a rally. He issued a clarification on his rally in Madison Square Garden rally in New York that he is not a Nazi, he is not Hitler, he is opposite to them. Yet they use that word freely, both words. They use it, he's Hitler. And then they say, he's a Nazi. I'm not a Nazi. I'm the opposite of a Nazi. I don't know. Sure. Trump's clarification came in the wake of his remarks about Puerto Rico citizens living in U.S. and other immigrants, even though they are legal. Many of his associated also made remarks that they were, they were called racist. Democratic nominee and U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris said that Trump was dividing the country. I think last night Donald Trump's uh, event in Madison Square Garden really highlighted a point that I've been making throughout this campaign. Uh, he is focused and actually fixated on his grievances, on himself, and on dividing our country. And it is not in any way something that will strengthen the American family, the American worker. It is nothing about what he is saying that is actually going to support the aspirations, the dreams, and the ambitions of the American people. Kamala Harris also addressed a rally in Michigan with factory workers of semiconductors. It is part of a Make in America project. There she tried to woo the workers with better facilities if she comes to power. She also attacked Trump for his garbage remarks. Just kind of diminishing who we are as America and talking down at people, talking about I don't know, we're the garbage can of the world. We're not. All right, our correspondent Shubhendu is joining us from Atlanta. Shubhendu, when we talk of the presidential race, then uh, the contenders are leaving no stone unturned, be it political attack, be it the war of words, be it personal attacks, political jibes. They are trying everything they, in their capacity to outdo the other. Uh, help us understand how do you gauge the election battle there in the U.S.? in its final, uh, final time. Uh, you put it right, uh, Preeti. Uh, good morning. Uh, indeed, as the election day is coming closer, the contest is getting intense, the attacks are getting sharper. I'm here in Atlanta, in Georgia, which is one of the most prominent swing states uh, in these uh, elections. Uh, pres uh, former President Donald Trump 
uh, had uh, participated in two public programs today. He uh, spoke in a rally at uh, George Tech University, and earlier he participated in a, uh, in a congregation of pastors uh, of Catholic uh, faith in the afternoon earlier today. And in his address, we can see the sharpness of the attack. Uh, while engaging with the priests, he spoke about the manner in which uh, Kamala Harris and the Democrats represents all that is anti-Christian, he called them uh, radical left. We saw those sharp attacks continuing in his rally at George Tech University uh, Stadium uh, rally that was attended by uh, hundreds of uh, uh, Republican followers there too. He uh, continued uh, his vitriolic attack uh, on the Democrats and Kamala Harris, uh, again on the issue of immigrants, uh, referring to them often as aliens. So we see these sharper attacks on the opponents continuing. Kamala Harris is also uh, giving it back to Donald Trump in her own way. Uh, the Democrats have also, as uh, Donald Trump tried to defend himself, have labeled him as Nazi and other names. So uh, we see such name calling and a particular level of narrative that is being uh, focused upon as we uh, move towards the day of the contest. Swing states is where the most intense battles are fought, Preeti. Swing states, seven swing states, including Georgia, where I am, uh, are going to, uh, the experts say, decide the fate of these elections. The electoral college votes matter, not the popular vote. Uh, whole of America, you can consider most of it being divided into red and blue state. Uh, it's almost given who's going to win in which state. But except for these swing states, where uh, the, the contest is very, very close, uh, this is where uh, the outcome of these presidential elections are going to be determined. Preeti? All right, um, uh, Shubhendu, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, you talked of how the electoral college vote uh, determines, uh, you know, the election result in swing states. Help us understand uh, more about uh, the, the opinions and the thought process in these swing states, uh, the issues which dominate the U.S. presidential race as a whole. To what extent do they have a bearing in these swing states? Uh, there are a given number of issues uh, that uh, we have uh, prominently highlighted, uh, Preeti, uh, all through these weeks that are dominating the elections. There is uh, the immigration issue. There is the economy issue. There is an issue of uh, abortion that is being talked about. Uh, there is also conflicts that are going on uh, outside of United States that are a matter of concern for the kind of investment that America makes in the conflicts outside. Uh, these are also the issues that, uh, that uh, impact the voters of the swing states. But we have to understand the manner in which swing states are different from any other state is that uh, the outcome when we do these polls, uh, exit poll sort of systems uh, are uh, put into use in these states, it's very difficult to uh, determine who is going to be coming out on top. Uh, it's a very, very close race. There is less than 1% difference in the uh, vote count uh, of the polling that is taking place uh, in these swing states. So it's very difficult to figure out uh, who the state is going to support uh, in, the, in the final outcome of the elections as compared to other red or blue state. For example, uh, say for example, New York, the contest is closed there as well, uh, but it is traditionally a blue state. The surveys show that Kamala Harris is comfortably ahead of Donald Trump. Similarly, a red state like Florida, where I, I was uh, uh, till yesterday, uh, is, is where uh, we see a closer competition and popular votes between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, but yet the surveys predict that uh, it is likely to go Donald Trump's way. It's been a consistently red state for some time. But these seven states, uh, swing states, which includes Georgia, Philadelphia is an important one. Uh, these states are the places where it's difficult for uh, pollsters, it's difficult for leaders to gauge uh, which way uh, does the population uh, swing uh, in terms of their vote. All right, Shubhendu, we leave it here. Thank you so much for joining in with those details. The issue of abortion rights lies at the heart of the U.S. presidential elections. There is a separate amendment on abortion rights, which is up for vote across several states. Between the tussle of pro-choice and pro-life sides, the outcome of the vote is expected to shape the future of women's identity and reproductive rights. DDDS correspondent Shubhendu Ghosh gets us more in this report. These presidential elections are turning out to be one of the most polarized in recent American history. Alongside the vote for the White House, the vote on amendment over the sensitive issue of abortion is also there. The outcome could have significant physical, emotional and social ramification for women in particular and the society in general. One side, 
pro-choice beliefs. It is about the fundamental right of women over their own body. The other side, pro-life, says they are fighting for the rights of the unborn child. The amendment on abortion or amendment 4 states that no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. It's been a contentious issue really for decades since the 1980s and the 1990s. But I think what made it really come to the fore in this election was the repeal of the Roe versus Wade decision, Supreme Court decision, which had allowed abortion access all across the United States. When that ban, when that decision was overturned by the Supreme Court, each state could decide for itself. And it threw the issue back into the public sphere. As early voting continues across Florida and other states, Voters appear divided over the issue of abortion. My beliefs line up more with pro-life. And so I'm voting for what most people are not in agreement for because I do believe that every life deserves to have a chance to speak for themselves. I have, like, you know, family members, you know, mom, sisters, like, you know, and they should have the right to be able to, like, you know, choose. Whether it's pro or against, it's going to be the voice of the people that come through. Last week, Kamala Harris took a detour from the barnstorming the battleground states with stops in Texas, a conservative state that was first to implement a near total abortion ban. Texas hasn't backed a Democratic president since 1976, and Republican Donald Trump is almost certain to win the state's 40 electoral college votes. But Democrats are betting. It provided a powerful backdrop for Vice President Harris's vision for abortion rights in the final days before the November 5th elections. With camera person Jay Shankar, Shubhendu Ghosh's report, DD India, Miami, Florida. Thousands of protesters gathered outside the Georgian parliament after the country's president and opposition parties called for protest against the result of a Saturday election. The four main opposition parties that won seats in Parliament also said that they did not recognize the results and that they would boycott the chamber. President Salome Zorabikvili said, and he in fact urged people to take to the streets, the country's government and electoral commission have said that the vote was free and fair, while election observers have said that there were significant violations. Georgia's Prime Minister has hailed the election result, rejecting allegations of vote rigging and violence. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department said that the United States joined calls from election observers for a full investigation of all reports of election-related violations in Georgia. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said that Washington does not have a final assessment of the results, but did not rule out further consequences if the Georgian government's direction does not change. The Georgian people went to the polls on Saturday in an election environment shaped by the ruling party's policies, including misuse of public resources, vote buying, and voter intimidation. This contributed to an uneven playing field and undermined public and international trust in the possibility of a fair outcome. We joined calls from international and local observers for a full investigation of all reports of election-related violations and urge respect for the fundamental freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly. A tanker carrying about 400,000 barrels of oil departed from Mexico's Pajaritos port en route to Cuba, where an acute energy crisis has left the island struggling to keep the lights on as the island has been grappling with widespread power outages, leaving residents struggling to maintain basic services and businesses operating at reduced capacity. Mexico has been supplying Cuba with crude and fuel since last year. Cuba lost about $13 million daily due to the U.S. embargo of the country. Bolivia's government has rejected claims by the former president, Evo Morales, that it ordered a targeted attack on him. Morales says that his car came under sustained gunfire on Sunday night in the Cochabamba region in what he condemned as an attempt on his life. But Bolivia's interior minister, Eduardo Del Castillo, said the former president's convoy had fled an anti-drugs patrol, during which his security team fired at the police and ran over an officer. 
Evo Morales is involved in a power struggle with President Luis Arce over who should be the Movement for Socialism Party's candidate in next year's election. Meanwhile, Mexican President Claudia Sheinbaum condemned the assassination attempt on former Bolivian President Sheinbaum, who stressed the need to avoid violence, took office earlier this month. For weeks, a split between Bolivian President Luis Arce and Morales has grown within the ruling Socialist Party. On the sidelines of French President Emmanuel Macron's three-day official visit to Morocco, France and Morocco signed an agreement seeking to boost initiatives covering sectors like energy, water and education and strengthening bilateral ties. Mending relations with a North African country after years of tensions, French President Emmanuel Macron also met Moroccan King Mohammed VI while attending the signing ceremony at the residence of the royal guests in Rabat. This while underscoring deepening relations between the two nations. Croatia will buy up to 50 Leopard 2A8 tanks from Germany in order to be able to replace Soviet-era tanks that it will in turn send to Ukraine. Croatia's Defence Minister Ivan Anisic said that after meeting with his German counterpart in Berlin, by acquiring the Leopard 2 A8 tanks, Croatia should deliver 30 battle tanks and 30 infantry fighting vehicles to Ukraine by the end of 2024. In a letter of intent signed by Anusic and German Defence Minister Boris Pistorius, both the countries also agreed to send spare parts and ammunition from Croatian stocks to Ukraine with financial support from Germany to be used for the Leopards. Uruguay is heading for a tight presidential election runoff next month after a first round on Sunday. The first round saw a centre-left candidate come top ahead of two candidates who split the conservative vote. Official results showed centre-left presidential candidate Yamandu Orsi with some 1.06 million votes. That was well ahead of the ruling conservative coalition's candidate Alvaro Delgado. In the third place was Andre Oyeda, who has pledged to back Delgado. The November 24th runoff vote will take place because no candidate got more than 50% of the first round vote. As a crucial transport infrastructure project, the railway track upgradation work on the Northern Line in Sri Lanka has been completed, resulting in better connectivity between Colombo and Northern Province. The train services were resumed from Colombo to Kanke Santurai in the north yesterday, while the return journey has commenced today. All right, for more on this, we have uh, uh, Muin Farooqi joining us uh, from Colombo. Ahmed, good morning. Now, we've told our viewers how crucial uh, this railway track would be for the people. Uh, help us understand more to what extent will it boost the infrastructure? Uh, very good morning to you, Preeti, and uh, all our viewers. Uh, yes, primarily speaking, this is a very, very crucial uh, infrastructure project because it connects the northern province to uh, the capital, Colombo. Uh, most of the services uh, for uh, the citizens have been uh, centered in and around uh, the capital, Colombo, for which people have to travel from various parts of the country. Uh, now, the northern uh, uh, province was normally uh, something which was already connected with the uh, uh, railway uh, network, but uh, it was having several uh, uh, speed restrictions which uh, delayed the uh, journeys which uh, people had to take uh, uh, from north to the uh, capital. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it was very jerky and it had a lot of speed restrictions. Uh, now, Irkon International has completed this Maho to uh, Oman Thai. The entire section is 128 kilometer long. Uh, it was done in two phases. The first phase was uh, from uh, Oman Thai till Anuradhapura, which was completed last year. And this year, the Maho to Anuradhapura, the remaining portion, that's about 65 kilometers, uh, that has been completed. Now, the uh, result is that uh, uh, the journeys will be reduced by about uh, two to three hours entirely uh, between the two cities of uh, Kanke Santurai and uh, Colombo. Kanke Santurai is just adjacent to Jaffna. So that, that has a tremendous impact with regard to the people who stay in Jaffna, Vani, uh, as well as uh, yeah, even up to uh, the people who stay in Anuradhapura, Vavuniya. So they will have better access to uh, the capital, uh, especially if they have to travel uh, for uh, an important day kind of a visit. Uh, uh, so that, that will uh, you know, uh, tremendously boost uh, uh, the journeys between the two places. Uh, notably, this project has been uh, 
uh, you know, executed under an Indian line of uh, credit uh, at a cost of about $91.27 million. Uh, but uh, overall, this has immense benefit with regard to connectivity uh, for the people of Sri Lanka. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Ahmed, for joining in with those details. And after this, we now take a look at other stories making it to the headlines from across the world. Just a week before the U.S. election day, officials are investigating two suspected arson attacks at ballot boxes in Oregon and Washington. An incendiary advice caused a fire in, in an Oregon ballot box early on Monday. And a similar fire in Washington reportedly destroyed or damaged hundreds of ballots. Amid this incident, officials ensure, assured that voting will proceed as planned. Protests against Bolivia's President Luis Arce have intensified with blockades in Coca Bamba's Saip Saip. On the 15th day of protests, the roads remain obstructed by felled trees, stones, and tires as supporters of former President Morales call for Arce's resignation amid fuel shortages and rising food prices. Authorities said the government will investigate the alleged attack on Morales, adding that police have not executed any operation against the former President. American rapper Seen John Combs is facing allegations of sexually assaulting a 10-year-old boy in 2005, adding to over two dozen claims of sexual misconduct. Lawyer Tony Busby, representing more than 150 alleged victims, filed the civil lawsuit on Monday in a New York court. In a separate federal case, Combs has pledged not guilty to charges of criminal sex trafficking, racketeering conspiracy and related felony counts. As Halloween years, New Yorkers are busy finding unique costumes. Popular picks this year include Deadpool, Wolverine and themed looks from the 1920s and 1970s. The store reports that movie influences and trends play a big role in costume choices. All right, back home, giving a boost to India's healthcare sector. On the occasion of Dhanvantri Jayanti and 9th Ayurveda Day, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will launch, inaugurate, and lay the foundation stone of multiple projects related to the health sector worth around 12,850 crore rupees at All India Institute of Ayurveda in the national capital. Prime Minister will launch expansion of health coverage to all the senior citizens aged 70 years and above. Prime Minister will also inaugurate and aid the foundation stone of multiple healthcare institutions. He will inaugurate phase 2 of India's first All India Institute of Ayurveda. He will also lay the foundation stone of five nursing colleges in Madhya Pradesh. Prime Minister will also launch the U-Win portal which will benefit pregnant women and infants by fully digitalizing the vaccination process. Also steps to strengthen the research and development and testing infrastructure to improve healthcare system in the country. In a major milestone for India's defence manufacturing sector, Prime Minister Narendra Modi along with President of Government of Spain Pedro Sanchez inaugurated India's first private facility for producing C-295 military aircraft in Vadodara. Now, this new facility is set to enhance India's defence capabilities and create an ecosystem for military aviation. Let's take a look at the specifics of C-295 programme. The inauguration of the C-295 military aircraft manufacturing facility in Vadodara marks India's private sector's entry into defence aircraft production. Prime Minister Narendra Modi had led the foundation stone for the Vadodara final assembly line in October 2022. Under the project, India is set to acquire 56 of these versatile aircraft. 16 complete units are being delivered by Airbus directly from Spain, while the remaining 40 units will be made in India by Tata Advanced Systems Limited. The facility in Vadodara is a significant step forward, becoming India's first private final assembly line for a military aircraft. With Tata Advanced Systems leading the manufacturing process, the project will involve assembling, testing, qualification and maintenance, establishing a full life cycle ecosystem for the C-295 aircraft in India. The benefits are further distributed across many companies in the defense spectrum. Bharat Electronics Limited, Bharat Dynamics Limited and various MSMEs are also contributing to the program. The C-295 aircraft is a next generation tactical airlift aircraft equipped to carry up to 9.5 tons of cargo and operate under all weather conditions. Its short takeoff and landing abilities make it highly adaptable 
even on unmatted surfaces, enabling quick deployment of troops and cargo for rapid response. The Rs 21,935 crore project between India and Airbus Spain aims to replace the aging Avro fleet in the Indian Air Force with the modern C295MW aircraft. This aircraft will strengthen India's air transport and operational readiness, making a major advancement in India's journey towards self-reliance in defence manufacturing. With the Vadodara facility in place, India's defence manufacturing sector has taken a crucial step towards self-reliance as well as in the field of Make in India and Make for the World objectives. Bureau of Port, DD India. American aerospace company GE Aerospace will finally supply engines for Tejas to Hindustan Aeronautics Limited by March next year. According to the Indian Defence Sources, GE would supply F404 engines for Tejas light combat aircraft LCA MK1A program by March 2025. Now, this supply shall finally clear the bottleneck and pave the way for the timely execution of the 48,000 crore rupees contract for 83 jets. HUL is expected to deliver 16 Tejas to the Indian Air Force in the financial year 2024-25. Days before Diwali, Delhi's air quality continues to be in the very poor category, posing significant health risks to the residents. The National Green Tribunal has issued notices to the Delhi Police Commissioner and Traffic Commissioner to file a response detailing the actions taken to control vehicular pollution. It also observed that a transparent process should be followed to invoke different stages of the Graded Response Action Plan. Meanwhile, in response to the worsening air quality, the centre urged state governments on Saturday to intensify their crop residue management measures to reduce pollution from stubble burning, a major contributing factor to air pollution during this season. India and the world light up for Diwali, a festival celebrating the triumph of light over darkness. From traditional rituals to global gatherings, Diwali unites communities in joy, peace and hope. Nancy Baloda brings us more. Lights, lamps, laughter and hope. That's Diwali, a festival rooted in Indian tradition yet celebrated by millions across borders and cultures. So why does this festival of lights resonate with so many? And what are the beautiful ways people bring Diwali to life? Diwali is more than just a celebration. It's a time when streets glow with the light of countless earthen lamps, fireworks light up the night sky and families gather to celebrate love, peace and hope. Celebration of Diwali marks the return of Lord Ram to Ayodhya after a 14-year exile. On a moonless night, the people of Ayodhya lit lamps to guide him back, a tradition kept alive today with rows of oil lamps symbolizing the victory of light over darkness and good over evil. Diwali is more than a one-day celebration. It unfolds over five days, each rich with unique rituals and significance. Dhanteras, the first day, sees families buying new household items or jewellery to invite prosperity. Choti Diwali, the second day, celebrates the triumph of good over evil, with people bathing early, decorating their homes and preparing sweets to share. The main day of Diwali is marked by lighting diyas, exchanging gifts and worshipping Goddess Lakshmi for health and happiness in the coming year. The fourth day, Govardhan Puja celebrates the importance of respecting nature and appreciating its resources. Bhai Dooj concludes with a day dedicated to sibling bonds as brothers and sisters exchange blessings and gifts in a spirit of love and unity. Diwali also has a deep spiritual meaning, celebrating the awakening of the inner light within each of us. People decorate their homes with rangolis, share sweets, exchange gifts and offer prayers to Goddess Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, hoping for prosperity in the year ahead. Nancy Baloda's report for DD India. 
As Diwali approaches, a growing number of consumers are turning to local handmade products to celebrate the festival of lights. This trend, known as Vocal for Local, aims to support Indian artisans, boost the local economy and also preserve traditional craftsmanship. Here's more on how this Diwali locally made products are lighting up homes across the country. <coughs> this Diwali, the spirit of Vocal for Local, is transforming the way people shop for the festive season. With a rise in demand for Indian-made products, the spotlight is on small businesses and local artisans producing everything from handcrafted decor to eco-friendly diyas. Our colors have been made with our hands, wall hanging from our hands, and we have made it with our hands. And we have made it with our hands, which are made with our hands. It is very beautiful and good to see it with our hands. These artists share their selling selling such beautiful things, handmade things, which is uh, so eco-friendly and being with them and seeing their artwork in our festival would definitely highlight my festival and make, it, make my festival so lighted and bright. I just opt for going for these uh, handmade products made by these art local people. You prefer those I prefer those instead of going to the malls, buying say imported stuff and all, I prefer buying it from them. In the last few years, the Indian government's initiative, Vocal for Local, has encouraged businesses to promote regional crafts, boosting India's economic self-reliance. From terracotta lamps to handmade sweets and textiles, consumers have a wide range of quality and locally made products to choose from. With millions celebrating Diwali with locally made products, the Vocal for Local campaign is helping to revitalize the Indian traditional art forms and supporting the India's economical resilience. This festive season, the true glow of Diwali shines not just in homes but also in the lives of the local artists across the country. With video journalist Praveen Sharma along with Kriti Vadera, this is Sumana Bhati Revana Siddhappa from New Delhi reporting for DD India. U.S. President Joe Biden marked the start of India's most important festival of the, of the year, Diwali, by warmly praising Vice President Kamala Harris at the White House. The event marked the celebration in the White House, reflecting the festive spirit of Diwali. The celebration not only honoured the tradition of Diwali, but also served as a reminder of the unity and strength found in diversity, reinforcing the White House's commitment to inclusivity and respect for all cultures. Updates on the world of business now. Nepal Civil Aviation Authority has taken action against Thai Air Asia, suspending all flights to Nepal with immediate effect. The move comes after a winter schedule was implemented for flights from October 27 to March 31st. However, the airline's flight to Kathmandu from Thailand was finally allowed to land at Tribhuvan International Airport. The flight was kept on hold for around an hour, but the landing was allowed, citing reasons of the safety of passengers and on humanitarian grounds. On to sports, Nepal and Bangladesh will face each other in the finals of the ongoing South Asian Football Federation Women's Championship on Wednesday. Earlier, Nepal defeated India in the semi-finals, securing its position in the finals, whereas Bangladesh entered the finals by defeating Bhutan on Sunday with a score of 7-1. Now, Nepal will contest with Bangladesh at Dashrath Stadium in the capital, Kathmandu. With a series level at one each, Harman Preet Kaur did lead India with, uh, and it will take on New Zealand women in the third and final ODI in Ahmedabad on Sunday. Indian women started the three-match series on a high note as the host claimed the first ODI by 59 runs. However, the White Ferns clawed back into the series with a dominating 76-run victory in the second game. Both the sides will aim to put their best performances and clinch the series by winning the deciding match. The Indian women will hope to replicate their showing from the first game and avoid any blunders. Manchester United have sacked man manager Eric Ten Hag after a disastrous start to the season. Former striker Radvan Nestelroy has been named the interim boss. United dropped to a lowly 14th position in the points table after suffering their fourth defeat in the nine league games on Sunday. They have won, they have won only one of their last eight games in all competitions. They are also 21st of 36 games in the Europa League table, 
having drawn their three opening fixtures. Ten Hag's position had been repeatedly called into question when the club finished eighth in the Premier League season last time. That's it in this edition of DD India News Art. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. For those of you on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates on the DD India mobile app and you can download the respective QR codes.